Hi everybody, it's Sarah Curry with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor a new tutorial every week and this week we are doing vintage truck. <laughs> we have Michael here working the cameras. Thank you for being here. Hello, you're welcome. And the whole inspiration behind this project is I thought that this was a really fun thing to do um, years ago when I was painting Father's Day gifts for the fathers in my life. I would paint um, their favorite vehicle, I guess. Um, using coffee and so I thought they they love those gifts and I thought like what a fun thing that we can kind of bring and mimic here so instead of using coffee we are using two colors but before we get into that I'm going to break down this project by steps so our very first step is we're going to be doing a light wash across our truck our second step is we will be putting in our medium values across our truck our third step you guessed it, we're putting in dark values on our truck. And um, while we're doing all of those washes, I'm kind of avoiding the smaller areas. So our fourth step is when we go in and attend to some of those areas like the headlights, um, inside the truck, maybe the wheels. Our fifth step is just any finishing details. And our very last step is painting in our ground. So that's it, six steps. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. We are using two paint brushes around six and around two. These are our go-to brushes. They're the LMA Classic Series. We use them for just about everything. And we're using two colors here. We are using sepia. Sepia. I say I say sepia, but it's a sepia. <laughs> and yellow ochre. Now, I do want to call attention to um, these paints. These are Dandelion Paint Co. paints. That's our in-house paint brand. They're custom mixed and made for you every single month. So sometimes our colors vary just a little bit. I noticed that um, this batch of uh, sepia is a little bit more orange than the one that I painted the original project with, but I actually kind of like that because I think it's gonna give it more a feeling of rust you know what I mean? Yes. Because it has that like orangey color. So I just wanted to call that out now. And we are going to trace our outline, do our oath, and then get into our painting. So you, you're gonna take your outline and you are going to tape it to your paper. Hey, I'm gonna see if this works, hold on. Ready? Sepia. 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 That's from the almighty Google. All right, so I've been saying it wrong. Me too. Sorry. Sepia, not right. I've been saying sepia wrong for three years. Sepia. Well, actually all my life, but only three years of it being recorded. So <laughs> it's embarrassing. Okay, that's fine, I'm fine. All right, so you're gonna tape your outline to your paper. You're gonna do graphite, shiny side down, and then you're just gonna take your pencil or pen or whatever you have and just start tracing. I always like to do a test little line and then adjust from there. So if you need to lighten your pressure, that will make a lighter line. If you want your line darker, then you press harder as you're tracing. Also, I want to call attention to the fact that um, our wheels are kind of more flat at the bottom. They're not a flat tire. It's just that if you look at wheel, I don't know how to describe it. More of a tire, the bottom of a tire touches the ground than you think. Just because something is round doesn't mean that the very tip of it is the only thing that touches the ground. And a car is heavy, so it like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it compresses the tire Yeah. the ground. Yeah, so it just like, but sometimes when we're like painting and stuff, it like this, you're just like, that is a flat tire, but it, it's not, it's that it's a thick three-dimensional tire that is going around. And so we're actually seeing that front part. And when it meets the ground, the ground is flat. So it's gonna like cut it off. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's why you should never over inflate your tires. You have less surface area and you'll skid out and die. Ooh, I do not want that. 
but also this is a vintage truck in a field so maybe if you're doing your tires and you're just like this tire looks flat well, maybe it is a flat tire you know maybe it hasn't been driven in a bit just a little reminder here the dashes are for you guys to pay attention to value shifts and changes usually I dash around like a darker value or a medium value to be like hey change up your values here um, I used to do hard lines but then I realized that that probably got really confusing between form and value so I try and like do a mix of both now so you guys can like better understand you had to take a guess Sarah what year and make and model is this truck this is a Ford okay I'm gonna say 56 are you totally making that up or I'm a hundred percent making that up well I gotta look up what a 56 Ford looks like now let's see how... I just like the number 56 <laughs> how do you are you making up that it's a Ford too yeah wow. what is it I fell for your confidence <laughs> Um, I don't know, and this might be betray that I'm a millennial, but they all kind of look the same to me. Whoa, don't uh, let your dad hear that, honey. Dad, don't listen to this. <laughs> and Michael and I are married. That's why I just called him honey, sorry. Allegedly. Ooh. How long, how long has it been, 11? 12. 12 years? I Dang. think. What year is it? Actually, I'm not going to do that math. Never <laughs> mind. It's going to be 12 this August. Yeah. Still tracing? I definitely don't think it's a Ford. <laughs> Is it a Chevrolet? Let's look. The hard thing is I have 1956 in front of it, so. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's looking a lot closer. To a Chevy? Yeah, the thing that's throwing me off is like the hood area. The other ones I'm seeing have detail on the hood. You know what I'm talking about? What do you mean detail on the hood? Like where the hood wraps around right above the wheel flare right there, where you have like a little streamline. Mm hmm These don't have that. But again, this might just be the year. Let's look in the, look in the 30s. Nope, totally different looking. All right, well, if you know what it is out there in Llama Land, please Let's share. Go. I was totally wrong with my Ford 1956 guess. <laughs> You know what it is, Sarah. This is what? the special uh, Detroit edition 1956 Ford. Yep. That's why. Yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. They're hard to find pictures of. They're impossible, actually. That's why I had to paint it. Yeah. Well, due to government mandate, they took all the pictures down. They're that way. <laughs> okay. And if you want to pencil in your grass, you can. If you don't want to, that's okay, too. I'm just checking to make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm going to do my dashes just so you guys can reference them, but you don't have to trace them on to yours. All right. We're good. Okay. If you guys can raise your right hand and repeat after me. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Thank you. I love starting that way. And I do want to just call out that this is a monochromatic painting, which means that we're really dealing with one hue. Um, and so it's all about values. That's how we're going to communicate form, is just adjusting our values. Um, this is a little bit trickier project. That doesn't mean you can't do it. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it. I just wanted to give you a little bit of warning that um, this one takes a little bit longer and you have to have a good sense of your values in, um, to, 
to do this one, but I'll guide you through it, okay? So I'm gonna take a little bit of sepia and a little bit of yellow ochre. And I'm gonna add water to it because I want a really light value. And I'm going to just start painting that light value on this truck. You mentioned in the past. Wait, about, wait. Oh. I'm going to avoid this highlighted area on the top here, and this top here, and this top here, okay? Sorry, honey, now you can ask me something. You said that you had painted this with coffee. Is mm -hmm. that more difficult than watercolor? Very similar than watercolor? It's similar to watercolor because it, it is a liquid you can paint with coffee or tea. Um, you would just be utilizing it the same way we use our paints, which is you would be using, you know, a more more concentrated, uh, like you would just water it down, like you would paint. So if you start with super concentrated coffee and then use it like we do liquid watercolors. Did you like, use a powdered coffee? Like what, what kind of coffee are we talking about? Did you like dip your brush in powder and then in water? No, so actually, Michael, your mother has this jar of coffee that she used to stain. She would make these really cute dolls and she would coffee stain or tea stain their dresses to give it like an antique feel. And so she just had this jar of like um, high concentrated coffee. I think she made it with instant coffee. Huh. And, um, and I just asked if I can use it and used it and painted with coffee. I guess the nice thing about painting with coffee, it smells better. Yeah, it did kind of smell like coffee. I haven't painted with tea though. I'm not sure because tea is a much lighter value in general um, than coffee. Like coffee, you can get really dark values. Um, so I'm not sure how painting with tea would go. And then just kind of like as you're filling in this light value, I want you to be looking at your reference photo and noticing where there are highlights and you know, like really, really like this part right here, it's mostly highlight. So I'm not really gonna touch it. So I just want you to pay attention to that as you're painting. It's hard for me because this like first step of doing the first layer, I always want to like do it fast so I can get to like, I don't know, the fun part of the adding different values. <laughs> and so sometimes I go a little bit too fast and get a little bit messy. So this is me just saying out loud to myself and also to you guys, take your time on this part. Do you enjoy vintage vehicles? Is it a dream of yours to like, retire and get an old T-Bird or something? I don't think so, <laughs> but I never- Not at this point. <laughs> I don't, I don't wanna limit myself because maybe, maybe one day I'm just like, you know what? I do wanna join a vintage car club and ride around with my husbands on Saturdays with all of my friends in their vintage vehicles. Like, I, that would be cool. I noticed you said husbands. Who are we planning on bringing into this? <laughs> Do I get a say? You weren't supposed to hear that okay. part. It's part of the larger your plan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny hearing you say the car things because those of you who might know Sarah personally know that her dad is the cariest car person that ever lived. Mm -hmm. It's funny that that didn't bleed into you. I don't know what to say about that. I remember growing up, your favorite car was one of those crusty Volvo station wagons. You love those things. It absolutely still is a white Volvo station wagon, 100%. <laughs> okay, I'm just about done 
you think of this layer as almost like the underpainting. Also, when we get into, there's like a grate. Is that the right word? A grate on front of, on grill. this truck? Grate or grill, yeah. Grill? A great grill. <laughs> and it kind of gets a little bit confusing of like, where are my highlights? Where are my dark values? What, what, what is what in this scenario? And I, to, to simplify it, I just kind of like made sure I left chunks of highlight. And so like some areas I just didn't paint and I left white. And then I'm just gonna paint in the other chunks. I'm just doing vertical, um, horizontal brush strokes. And because as long as we can give off the illusion that there are, it goes like this, then our job is done. And sometimes I just don't wanna to have to sit and figure out which line belongs to which line that continues underneath and is highlighted. You know what I mean? Like, I wanna focus on other things. So I'm, a, I'm more of a fan of uh, just giving the viewer enough information so they can kinda of tell what's going on and then like, that's it, you know? Totally. Okay, now we can start putting in our medium values. So I'm gonna take some sepia. If you wanna mix yellow ochre into this, you can. Um, because this, this color mixture is a little bit more warm than what I painted with, I don't know if it's totally necessary. I think you can get away with just using the sepia. Um, but you're welcome to add it if you like that it adds that kind of gold warmth to it. I, I really love yellow ochre for that reason that it like is gold, you know? So you guys get to choose, you're the artist here. And now I'm gonna start putting in my medium values. So if I were to look at this painting, if, and if I were to identify my darkest darks, so I'm looking at here, by the wheels, by the front, and underneath. Those are my darkest darks. And then my lightest lights are the highlighted highlights here, 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 and then on some of the wheels and the grate. So everything in between is my medium values. And there is a range between that. Like I want you to notice that if you look on the door, there is a range of value where the top is a lighter value than the bottom, but neither one is the lightest light and the darkest dark. So even when we're putting in our medium values, there are ranges, okay? And so I'm going to take my uh, sepia and just starting on the bottom here, I'm gonna put in that medium and then I'm gonna rinse my brush to get a lighter value and blend to the highlight avoiding that highlight at the very top, and then it gets that medium value on the back. Okay, I know this from John Cray, my father. Mm -hmm. This type of truck is called a step side truck. Because it has this step? Because it has like, you can see the rounded wheel covering. Mm -hmm. Where on like most modern trucks, they're called fleet side trucks, and it looks like straight lines. There's no like bulbous wheel covering. Oh, okay, cool. So I just wanna point out, we put in our medium values, but there was a range. And then you just have to do some, I, I like to say the word finessing, to kind of blend those areas back and forth. Now, if you, if you go like this too much, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you'll totally even out your values. So I like to push, if I want my values to be in a darker like section right here where I want my value to be darker here, when I blend, I'll blend down. Okay. Sarah, at this stage in your painting career, do you often like mess the paper up? Like overwork a spot? No. Because that happens to me when I paint. No, and I think a lot of that has to do with, um, I think that once you're a little bit seasoned, you feel more comfortable making mistakes or you feel more comfortable accepting what happens. Mm -hmm where I think when we're trying something new, we put this pressure really on ourselves that to be considered real or talented that no mistakes can be made or it has to be like, you know, perfect. And so when there is an area that like we kind of messed up and we want to fix, we'll work it and we'll try and work it out because we think that that is what is going to like 
define us a little bit or our skill set. <laughs> but I just want to say that I'm, the other thing too is um, there are some things where if an accident happens or if something happens and I didn't mean for it to happen, I, can fi I have enough experience to know I can blend that out. I can fix that or that one's too far gone. That one's too far gone. I gotta. I just gotta throw that away and start again. So I think that's the other thing too. Is you learn as you go what ones you can fix without degrading the paper. Okay, I know I'm jumping around so much. How about wheel well? Does that feel better to you? Yes. That is the word I was looking for and I was expecting. I feel like that refers to the inside specifically, which I think you were asking about. Yeah. So again, we're putting in our medium values. And I'm blending down because I want it to stay darkest at the bottom here. No, this project is you really could have done it with any of the colors that came with it. You could do this yeah, project, color, yeah, with mono, monochromatic, well, you could do that with any project, but really with monochromatic paintings, where you're just dealing with one hue, you can do any color you want. One hue, multiple shades, is that right? One hue, multiple values. values. Shades is when you add black, and we aren't adding black. Okay. Is it still considered monochromatic if you, like, add shades to it? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because shades, if you add black or white, it doesn't affect the hue, it affects the value. Perfect. Okay. Now we're going to go, so I did the side here, and now I'm going to go to the this part. I'm just going to start putting in, so the darkest value on my, this section is actually the front part of this truck. So I'm gonna try and keep keep that um, value nice and dark, and then it will lighten as it moves out. And again, I'm just utilizing water to lighten my values here. And you want to work fairly quickly when you're doing it this way, like putting in a dark value and then blending, because the paint color, the paint itself is much easier to blend when it doesn't have a lot of time to dry on that paper. So I would try and work fairly quickly, because then I can, I have a higher chance of getting a smoother blend. If you put it down and let it dry and then go back in with water and blend it out, you have a higher chance of getting blooms, which Honestly, I think blooms are beautiful, and as long as they don't distract from the overall picture, if it, if it doesn't distract your viewer enough that they can still tell what's going on, then I don't see anything wrong with blooms. And most of the time, I embrace them. And, you know, you just kind of, you can't really get mad at at water and watercolor for doing what it's supposed to do, right? Like that is the joy. Okay. And at this point, we should start to feel the three dimensionality of our truck emerge just a little bit. Can you guys see that where we put in our medium values? Totally. It's starting to kind of pop. Things are popping out, things are receding. Usually the rules of art are that if you want something to come forward in space, it's a lighter value. If you want something to recede in space, it's a darker value. Now, the reason why this is different here is because our light source is coming from the top. So because our light source is coming from the top, our, the top of this vehicle is lit. And so the, the things on the side underneath it are shadowed. Whereas if the light was coming from the front, then this part would actually be the highlighted section. Does that make sense? So there's two things at play here. You have to think about your light source, and then you also have to think about the actual form of the vehicle. And then your light source on that form will determine where your highlights and your shadows are, okay? So I'm just gonna keep keeping on here, putting in my medium values, 
and then blending those out to meet my light values that I put in in step one. Gosh, I think the color of this is actually really beautiful. Yeah. That like, it totally reminds me of the color of rust. Which in case all of you listeners in Llama Land, it's uh, oxidized iron. Hmm. You know when you see like a old copper roof and it's like green? Yes, yes. That's rust, that's copper rust, that's oxidized. They call it patina. It's beautiful. Uh, brass does it, bronze does it, metals that have uh, potential energy left in them can still rust. In Kansas City, there's a lot of old buildings like churches that were built with copper roofs and they're like turquoisey color because of the, the yeah, rust on they're them. They're so beautiful. They're gorgeous. Patina. Okay, now we're getting to the hood of the truck. Did I say that <laughs> correct? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna start with my darkest value on the bottom. I feel like in England they have different names for things. Like they think they call a trunk a boot. Oh really? And I feel like they call a hood a bonnet, but I could be told. Totally oh my wrong. gosh, I love that so much better than hood. It's a bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. So again, I put in my my I'm saying my dark value, but we're doing our medium values right now. It's the darkest of the medium value and then blending that out to meet and transition into my light value that I put in step one, and I'm using water. Now, one thing that I want to mention is if you can see my paper towel right here, you can see how wet that is. And that is because you have to make sure that you utilize your paper towel or your tea towel or your cloth, whatever you use, because if you don't, and you're working in light values like this, you're gonna have way too much water on your paper because you're gonna get your paintbrush wet and then just paint with it and it's just gonna be water, water, water. It's gonna be super difficult to control. So what I like to do is I'll paint or I'll pick up paint, grab water if I need to, and then hit it off my paper towel too. And then that way I know I'm getting rid of excess water. If you have water when you're supposed to be dry, you're gonna have a bad time. Yeah. And it can be really frustrating, but I just wanna give you guys a little encouragement that when it comes to water control with watercolor, that is a that just takes time to learn. It's not something that like comes natural to us. Um, so if if you're kind of new and you are just getting so frustrated because you can't figure out how much water and paint ratio you need to have on your brush, I just suggest keep painting. Like really just keep going um, because then you'll start to get a feel for how much should be on your brush and you'll be able to tell by like your first brush stroke laying it down if there's too much water or too much paint. The other thing that I like to do if I need to blend out, so I put in my dark value here is I'll rinse and then blot on my paper towel and then blend out. So again, I'm utilizing that paper towel to absorb any extra water so then my paper doesn't turn into a puddle. Look how pretty my paper towel is. Yeah. I'm loving that. <laughs> There's an effect. So I sit back here at a table and I watch a screen that has all the cameras on it, right? Mm -hmm. The main camera is high resolution and then the rest of them, I don't know why to save processing power, are pretty low resolution, okay? Okay. On the low resolution cameras, like the top camera right now, the painting, your like reference painting, mm -hmm. looks like a real vehicle. I, I don't know how to describe this effect, but like when you look at something in low resolution, it makes it look more real. Yes. Yeah. It's a, I think it's the same kind of concept that if you look at your painting from far away, yeah. it pops more. Yeah. It's weird. It is weird. 
I think it's because our brain fills in the gaps of what's uh, missing. And so then our brain is just like making that feel really three dimensional because it's like, oh, that's a truck. I can tell that it has form and my brain is kind of like, I'm, that's a total guess, I'm not sure. It totally looks like on this screen right now, it looks like you could pick that up and roll it around. Really? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, I did that on purpose. <laughs> So if you think your paintings are bad, take your glasses off. I always, I always look at my paintings from far away or I snap a photo of it, actually. Squint. <laughs> I squint. But also snapping a photo of it does a similar thing to me where I think it's because it, it makes something that we're seeing in three-dimensionality because we see things in three-dimensional space and making it two-dimensional, which then just kind of like tightens it almost, I think. Tighten. That's what I think, but. I probably, I should look into that more and, and like really try and figure out. On today's episode of Making Stuff Up with the Craze. <laughs> On today's episode of I feel <coughs> kind of confident in what I'm saying right now, so I'm just gonna go for it. If you really wanna convince people, just say, I read an article and it said blank, and then make up whatever you want. There we go. I read an article that said if you do that, you know, yeah. squint at it. <laughs> okay, so our truck is starting to pop out. Congratulations, we're doing a good job. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna move on to this kind of like great section here. And I just wanna call attention to like the grate itself is three dimensional. It has a thickness to it, which means when we get to these little windows here, I kind of want to leave a highlight, like a little edge on some of them to show that you would see like that thick edge on the inside of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. But in terms of like at which part and where, mm, I kind of just faked it till I maked it, made it. Like I just. <laughs> I like maked it. <laughs> faked it till I maked it. <laughs> That's a bumper that you're working on, yeah? I don't know. I felt like it was like added on, like for farming equipment or something. I'm not sure. <sighs> That's really embarrassing when I talk about vehicles. I've always promised myself that the next time I paint a vehicle, I'll like research the different parts <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about and I never do it. I would love to walk in on you on our couch with like a printout of a, a exploded vehicle drawing. It's like, figure one, wheel. Wheel. Figure two, wheel well. Bumper. Bumper. And you're just studying, you got your, your pan in your mouth, chewing on it out of frustration. Cause it's just like every time I see in the comments, people are laughing at the stuff I don't know. And I'm like, listen, I, I paint things, okay? I don't, it just cracks me up. But maybe one day I'll, uh, I'll actually do that. Until then, just be patient with me and paint you have along other with skills. me. For example, Sarah can, in a single sitting, eat a whole bag of jalapeno chips. 100% I can. The cook Cup of milk, whole bag of jalapeno chips. Yeah, you need the milk because it turns down that spice because those jalapeno chips, after a while, they get spicy. Yeah, after a whole bag, yeah. When you're licking the, the crumbs out of the bottom, that's the concentrated spice. Listen, everybody needs their chips, okay? <laughs> I'll reach over, I'll bring a fresh bag, pop it open, and like get distracted by a show and reach to grab one and it's just air left in there. You gotta, you gotta, I, I don't. <laughs> you have no defense. I, I have no defense and I don't feel like I need one. <laughs> I deserve to have chips. You gotta act quick around me, you know what I mean? <laughs> what? You gotta act quick. You do. I should just take a bite before I give the bag to you. That way I could like be guaranteed one. You need to just buy your own bag and then not tell you me where it is. You know what's funny is I have bought two at once for that purpose and you eat mine too. <laughs> well, because you gotta hide it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.
Okay. Now I'm going to start paying attention to my wheels because I've been kind of ignoring them. And that's mostly because wheels are doubly confusing, especially in a monochromatic painting because we're limiting ourselves in terms of our color. So we don't have like a black section, which is how like really we can tell easily that something is a wheel. And we're dealing with the metallic surface, which makes it way more it has a strong reflection, which means there's a lot of different values just within that area, which is the hubcap. Nice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it just gets a little bit like confusing. So the thing that you guys just want to keep in mind, and I'm gonna switch to my two, is we wanna communicate that this outer ring is the darkest value because it's black compared to metallic. It also is thick, and then there's just a lot of like curves and stuff in between. So if we're painting our tire here, like the tire, tire part, there'd be a little, there would be a value coming out here, a darker value. And we'll go back in and darken this part because it needs to be the darkest part. Um, because it's coming out of the vehicle and then it lightens as it rounds, rounds down. I feel like the 50s were like the golden age of making cool car designs. And I mm -hmm. recently saw a tire ad, I think it was Michelin, and they were starting to produce glow in the dark, clear tires. No way. Yeah. That's cool. And then um, here is like a metallic surface. So it just, I just don't want you guys to spend too much time here because I don't. And as long as we can tell that like, yes, there is a wheel and here are sections within that wheel. So you're just kind of doing like oval shapes around this wheel in varying values. Remember the early days of your painting career and you did a custom one for our friend and you painted like a Star Wars character on a dragon? Yes. <laughs> I do remember that. I've had some fun custom paintings. Now the other thing I want to say is, let's say you're doing your wheel and you're just like, nothing can save this wheel. You're like, I don't know what's going on. It just looks funky. I can't, whatever. We, I, we, you can strategically place your grass so it kind of covers the funky parts. So don't worry about it. That's why I grow facial hair. <laughs> That's the subtext of my life actually. Strategically cover the funky parts. That was funny. <laughs> Sorry, I was just I was just focusing and so I wasn't listening. Okay. My comedy is like great art. It'll be it'll be appreciated when I'm gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. All great artists are appreciated. I mean, except you, obviously. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna leave that alone for now. But I feel like I I really gave enough information, so like people can tell that that's a wheel. Name that wheel Brittany and you leave it alone. <laughs> That's right. Okay, now I'm going to go to, what is this called? The step. The step. That's it. I'm just going to call it the step. <laughs> and it's going to have a shadow on the edge, kind of where it's thick. And then it has really thin lines on that, that metal. So I'm actually going to turn my paper to make it easier. And I'm just going to... Do a couple like that. Try and follow the same angle as this edge. This one kind of went off a bit, but the, the angle of these lines would be the same angle as this edge. Okay. 
trying to decide which one to attack next. Let's do this back wheel. And this one is farther away from us and much more hidden, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on that either. And it's gonna be a really dark value, the edges, so I'm kind of just putting in that center part. And then we got our little exhaust pipe. Here. And then we have to pay attention to the um, bed of the truck. So I'm going to, to communicate that this part is popping out away from the body, we need to make it a darker value where it's part popping out from. So I'm going to put in my dark value and then blend out. But the lip on this truck bed is going to stay kind of like a highlight to show that it's an edge. And then to communicate, oh, that's a really dark value. We're not going to do that yet. Sometimes I get excited and I just want to put my really dark values in right away. And that's not helpful when I'm teaching, so I'm trying to be better about that. Okay, and now we're going to go into the grill section. And just this is where we're going to kind of be paying attention to putting in our different values, making sure there's highlights, but also putting in... <laughs> Me. You okay? Yeah. Put in a medium ones, and then we'll go back in and put in darker ones too. This is a pretty dark that I'm putting in now, but I can lift. Did you, while you were painting with coffee, were you ever tempted to like lick your paintbrush? Oh no! Oh my gosh! Because it was like old. It was like Just a jar sink. that was under your mom's sink for like a long time. It's usually where the best food is. It was like, <laughs> I feel like even like the lid had a little bit of mold on it. <laughs> so no, so but you're if you were not a connoisseur of fine food, <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. Maybe if it was like fresh. Okay, but here's the thing: is like, I'm. Like straight coffee is pretty strong. And so maybe if there was like milk and sugar, I would be tempted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm feeling pretty darn good about this truck so far. Now we're gonna go in and we're gonna put in our darkest values. So this is where we will be working um, dark. Now, you do have a bunch of other colors. If you bought this May subscription box, you have a bunch of other colors in this box. You can utilize those other colors to mix a darker color if you want. How would um, you go about that? What would you mix into it? Um, I would probably mix, well, I'll show you. I won't paint with it. Well, never say never, but I'm gonna start with magenta and green. And I'm gonna mix uh, emerald green. And let's just see what brown we get. Let me get my test swatch here. Magenta, green, sepia. Ooh, that's magic to me. Straight sepia, dark value is pretty similar. See how it's just a Lighter. click darker, the mixed one. So you can, you can utilize that if you want. If you have just the kit and you only have the uh, two colors, that's fine. You can just use straight sepia. As long as it's your darkest value on your painting, it's going to read as your darkest value. It's going to read as your shadow. Okay, so now I'm going to take straight sepia and put it in my darkest value areas. But you want to make sure that your painting is dry at this point because when you're working with dark things, it's a lot of paint, a lot of <laughs> like saturated, concentrated color. So if an area is wet, it, it will bleed into that area. So you just wanna, oh God. I love putting in darkest values. I feel like they just 
really pop. It's so fabulous. The other thing about not only does uh, it bleed if it's wet, but if it's not dry and you're trying to like do your darkest darks and it's just a damp area, then that color will not only bleed, but like spread out, which makes it really difficult to control um, where, the, where it stays dark. Does that make sense? So if an area is just not getting as dark as you want and you keep doing layers and it's just not, it's not staying dark, let it dry. And you can see that even with my darkest dark that I'm putting in, I am still letting a little bit of light shine into that, meaning I'm still putting in some like blending out with water a bit, especially on these wheels, to let some light into that dark. And then that I'm gonna dry before I put in my dark value behind that tire. I'm gonna move into my inside of my truck bed. Okay. Oh, it's looking so good already. Okay, we're going to do our back tire here. You still on a two? I'm still using a two because these are kind of tinier areas. Okay. And then let's, uh, let's attack this, the window area. The first thing I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do a wash, a light wash across the whole thing. You don't want to leave it the white of the paper, even the areas where it's clear because, um, because there's a window there and we want to communicate that there's like glass somehow. I think that value got a little bit dark. So while it's wet, I'm just going to lift. It's still going to have a hint of color, but not be as light. I mean, as dark, which is exactly what I want. I want it to be a nice light value. It's actually really funny because for Father's Day, Michael's father is extremely talented. He's a contractor, but he's also an artist. He doesn't take a lot of time to make stuff, which is unfortunate because he's very talented. But one time for Father's Day, I painted him a similar truck like this with coffee, like I've said before. but. When I got to the window, I just left it white of the paper because it was a window and I'm like, it's clear. And then uh, he came to me and he was just like, Sarah, he was just like, you left, he's like, the window, there's a window there. You have to put that there's a window there. It can't just be the white of the paper. <laughs> so I went in and he I fixed you. it. He did. Your gift <laughs> yeah, he came to me a couple days later and asked me to fix it. <laughs> and now you know why I see a therapist. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's great. You just have to remember with things like that. I think at first I was just like, oh, and then I was just like, okay, you're right. I got to put a window in there. You know what I mean? Like, and also that just shows you that even though he doesn't create that much, he can tell, he can see that, which I think is a skill to be able to look at a painting and understand what's going on and um, how to adjust it. I remember growing up, we had this beautiful landscape with like a grass field and a wooden fence and I just grew up my whole life assuming that like they had purchased it my dad did that on a brown grocery bag with crayons yeah and it was like it really is amazing I had no I know I it was I've a painting. first of all I thought it was a painting I've seen that that's still hanging up I think Also, I remember being a young kid at church. He's had the same set. He's had like the same Bible forever. Mm -hmm. And he doodles in it. He like doodles little like biblical pictures on the pages. And I remember like just loving paging through and trying to find all the drawings in there. Ooh, that's so cool. 
Okay, now I'm going to put in my darkest value on this, these grill parts. Well, your dad's a car person and you don't know cars and my parents are art people and I'm all thumbs, mm. so. I don't think you are. You have to be nice to me because we're married. No, I've taken an art class with you. <laughs> watercolor. We took watercolor together. We did. I did not get it then. I totally did not either. <laughs> I struggled. That's when my energy drink addiction happened. I just drink a bunch of Red Bulls and go paint. Okay. We are, we are making our way on this truck, you guys. So just as you're putting in these darker areas on your grill and kind of like painting the grill and the grate at the same time and you're like, what is what? Again, just kind of more pay attention to making sure that you have some sections that are highlighted, some that are a darker value and some that are a medium value and then try and have these lines, I don't even know if that's true, yeah, try and have them line up on either side. So if there's a dark value going across here, it's gonna continue underneath this section. And over here too, actually. There we go. That feels pretty good. Okay, and then I'm going to do a dark value around the headlights to show that there's like a ring, you know, that it, that the body actually like goes in and has a hole to make room for those lights. So it's a darker value around it. Again, <laughs> these headlights, I mean, circles honestly are just hard. <laughs> they're hard. They're hard to like get perfectly straight. So again, don't stress about them as long as your viewer can tell that there are circles there that are going to be headlights. That's all you got to really worry about because uh, they just get kind of wonky. You know what was cool about older vehicles? Hmm. I mean, in, even fairly recent, I remember like my dad's truck, which was a, from the 80s, had it. When the headlight burns out, you just pull the entire thing and throw it away, and it was glass, and you just pop a whole new one in. You don't have to worry about like your headlights clouding up when they got old. Mm. Like the whole unit just like. Yeah, that's cool. That was a good pop noise. It was good. Okay, I put in some darker values on the bonnet of my truck. I gotta make sure I told you the right thing. <laughs> yeah, please do. Hold, and I'm just blending out. And then there's like a little part of this hood that kind of comes up and has a, on like a different plane. So we're putting a slight shadow in there to show that on the highlighted section. I was right, it's correct. It's a bonnet. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back in and pay attention to, I'm not doing my windshield yet, but I am gonna put in, if you look at my door, the door part itself actually sticks out compared to what's around the window. So I need to separate that just slightly. And I'm gonna put in a darker value. That was a little bit too, too dark, so I'm gonna use water to pull that color and blend it out. Do you think in our lifetime it will be like gas cars will be a collector item and that's it? Do you think it'll be all electric or do you think no? I don't know. I definitely think that that's where it's going. But in our lifetime for it to be all, probably not. I mean, I think that that 
I mean, cars are expensive, you know, like. Yeah. I mean, I get that feeling too, like it can't move that fast. But then I think like my grandparents, you know. I like, mean, I guess that's true for like. Saw so much stuff. Some of the electronics that we've seen, you know. Look, look at this magical glass panel in my hand. <laughs> yeah. That I can call anyone from around the world on. Okay. And then also too, as you're putting in these dark values, you might have to like do some adjusting where like before some of these areas were supposed to be like my medium values and they got too white. So I'm going back in and I'm adjusting those. And that's what I mean when I say, your painting will inform you as you go. Like as you're making these decisions, how you put values where, you have to sometimes go back and adjust. I feel like it needs to be just a little bit darker right on the top, so I'm doing another layer. Yeah. And then that's dry now, so I can go in and put that in there. Like so. Maybe do another layer on the side that. And then let's attack these headlights. So what I do with the headlights, I try and keep it really simple. I kind of follow, cause they're kind of a, what's that word? Um, oh, it's like, you know that finish that's like metallic and when you move it, the light hits it differently and it changes color and it has a bunch of different- Iridescent? No. Holo- Holographic? I can't think of the word, but anyway. one of those days, we're having a hard day. Yeah. Um, I put in my dark value, like just a few, and then I leave some sections for a highlight, and then I just blend out around it. Prismatic. Prismatic, thank you. Is that it? Yeah, I think so. That's all I do. I don't, I don't try and go there, go in and crazy adjust. I just, again, just understanding that there's a lot of different values going on in here because it's reflective. There's a bunch of different, like, facets in there it kind of reminds me of like the an eye of a fly you know what I mean you know how it okay multifaceted yeah very slow today they're just coming to me like 10 minutes later after we talked to them oh my gosh me too <laughs> Did you have a coffee this morning? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's our problem. Me, me neither. Okay. Now, I'm gonna look at my windows. So on the very top rim right here, I want that to be like almost black. So maybe I will mix a little bit of these other colors in here to get that. Try, I wonder what would happen if I put space blue in there. Should we just try it? Totally. Because space blue is just a dark value naturally. Ooh, but it makes it green, so I gotta tone that down using magenta. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> Look at that, what? Just your excitement's awesome. Although I will say that I just realized that by mixing in these colors for this dark, I don't know if I can consider this a monochromatic painting anymore. Can I? It's still brown. Uh, I won't, well, I won't ask you about it. You can just tell me it is. Great. As long as we've all agreed on that. <laughs> okay. And we just have to do this in kind of like sections because we don't want things like bleeding into each other. Another thing that we could do is we got to put in our door handle so that it really is just like a shadow. If you have bleed proof white, you can do a little highlight on the top or um, 
you can try and lift up some of the color, but I'm just painting like a darker value around where it would stick out. Okay? And then there's also like these lines on this truck where these, I would assume maybe the panels meet. And we can put that in too. I feel like I need to soften this a bit. Mm, that feels good. Sarah, as someone who likes to like tinker on guitar, yeah, I find myself when I'm like, kids are in bed and I finally grab one and I sit on the couch. There's like a few things I do that are comfortable for me and mm -hmm. I just like find myself doing them all the time. Do you have a paint analog to that? Do you like when, do you just like pop out a flower? Like what is your go-to? Just like I'm not thinking about it and I painted it, what is it? Oh, um, yeah, probably like flowers, flowers or leaves. Like when I'm testing colors and like brushes, yeah. I'll automatically just start painting leaves. Okay. Then we have to do these things. I don't know what they're all, they are, I'm sorry. Nostrils. But we gotta paint the nostrils. We're just gonna start using human anatomy on this vehicle. And I'm just leaving a thin white line because it's like a metallic ring around these. I truly have no idea what they are. I think they're just chrome accents, probably. Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And okay. It's looking good. I do think that I need to pay a little bit more attention to the front of this bonnet. I think it's too light of a value and I, I wanted to have the same feeling that this, where it's like clearly flat on the front and then rounds to the top. This is also that similar flat on the front and rounds to the top. So that means I need to darken the face of it a little bit more and blend out do a nice transition to the to the top part. But how um, smooth that transition is and how long it takes will inform the viewer of the angles. So I felt like on this truck, it actually had a really clear definition, front, top. So it was strong, so that's why there's such a strong edge. If it was a smoother round transition, then this would be, like an even transition all the way to the top and then the very top would just be a highlight. And so I just wanna point out that how sharp where it transitions will inform your viewer of the overall shape. So if we make this transition too smooth, then it's gonna feel round. If we do dark value highlight, then that feels sharp. Does that make sense? Yep. But the tricky thing with that is you still have to match your values. Because it's like, okay, I wanna show that it's a sharp transition, but also I don't want the roof of this to be so light that it feels like it's on a different like painting. I want them to feel like they belong in the same world. So sometimes, like I said earlier, I have to go in and darken my highlights just a little bit. So then it's not so disjointed. Okay, now let's go into, ooh, you can tell I had a little more yellow ochre on that. See how that's warmer? Yeah, I like it. Me too, actually. I might, I might lean into that a little bit on other areas. Sometimes what I'll do is if it's like one section has a little bit more color than the other, to make it feel like it was on purpose, I'll just like add a little wash of that other color a couple other places. So then it's just like, yeah, I did that on purpose. I meant to do that. I'm realizing I gotta go back in and put in this dark one. I lost that, that value evened out. Mm. 
I feel like it would be nice to have a little warmth over here. And let's do a little bit on the roof. Ooh, I love what that yellow does. Look at that. Okay, now let's finish this off. So the inside of the cab, we would see the back of it, but we want it to be a lighter value than this rim. So it's a dark value, but not the darkest, but still way darker than our medium, okay? And then it's gonna continue up over here. It looks like I didn't put an outline in for that section, but you can just eyeball it. And you just wanna make sure that it's dark enough that it recedes. So you might have to do another layer on top of that because what we don't want is we don't want this back part of the cab of the truck that we see through the window, we don't want that popping forward. So you just gotta get that value dark enough that it's pushed out. Shoot, I gotta thicken this because I painted over my <laughs> edge. There we go, not a big deal. I'm using my six. Okay, that's starting to feel better to me. Okay. And then I'm gonna take my two and put in some of these detail lines. So like around the window, there's a line. So I gotta put that in and I'm just gonna twist my paper around. Then there's one where it kind of sections off here. And sometimes just going in and kind of like defining some of these things. I know I've talked heavily about outlines before, but sometimes they just tighten up an image nicely. You just wanna make sure when you're doing this, like adding just a continuous line around some of the forms that the value isn't too dark because then it will feel like an outline and it will kind of feel like a coloring book. Well, flatten all your hard work. And now we've kind of been working on the smaller areas in the dark uh, values so step three and four simultaneously um, now I'm feeling good to the point that we can just start working and doing um, our fifth step which is just details and what I mean by details I mean this is where you're gonna want to step away from your painting this is where you're gonna want to really look at where your values are and make any adjustments and changes um, so I'm gonna kind of darken some of these areas. And then like pay attention to your highlights too. Like this I've left the, the white of the paper because it is it is like a chrome um, detail, but I'm just gonna tone it down a little bit. So pay attention to where your values are if you need to just add, just sometimes the lightest wash is all you need to tone something down and then you can move on.
So if you need to darken anything, maybe back here, I gotta separate that a little bit more. One thing that you can do to see if what values are, and I know this sounds silly, but it's really a trick that I use, is I unfocus my eyes while I'm looking at something. And when you unfocus your eyes and look at something, it is easier to just see the values. So if I were to look at this and kind of blur my eyes a little bit, then my I can easily see where my darkest values are and where my highlights are. So it's a great tool. Okay, and then I think we're just about ready for our last step, which is just putting in our grass. How's our truck looking? It's, it's lovely. You like it? I'm constantly surprised how smooth you can make a surface with those tiny brushes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, is a, it is a little bit of work, but it's worth it, you know? Okay, so I'm going to take my round two and grab some color. And um, well, let's do this first. I'm gonna do my six, actually. I'm gonna grab my uh, sepia and I'm gonna do horizontal strokes across the ground like this. Go behind the tire as well, okay? And then back here. And then I'm going to do it a little bit underneath the vehicle as if, because the vehicle would be casting a shadow. A little bit of a shadow underneath here and underneath this tire. If some colors bleed out, that's okay. But we're just trying to like ground, ground our truck here. But try and do horizontal around it because the ground is horizontal. I know it's tempting to follow the shadow of the shape of what you're creating. Like I would do circle around the tire, but it's not true because the shadow is actually on a flat surface. Okay, now I'm gonna take my round two and start doing some long pieces of grass. And then if you want it to have like that like weed feel, you can do little lines off of it. I kinda like to do dashes and, and dots a little bit because think of the thickness of a piece of wheat or a piece of grass that has those little things at the top. It's super thin, super, super thin. So when we're trying to render that next to something that's thick and substantial, we have to keep that in mind, which means that it wouldn't read as a perfectly thick line. It would actually probably read as like here and there line and, and have little dashes and dots in it because it's supposed to be super thin. You can do grass in front of the tire also, like right as it's coming off. Remember to kind of curve it. This truck kind of reminds me of a, we have a farm truck called Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell at our house. And I'm just thinking of it kind of being parked in our field. So I'm painting the grass kind of around. She's ironically named Tinkerbell for all of you out there. It, she's giant and rusty and came with the house. And yep. And then if you want to do some little grass over here, you can. And that's it. That's our truck. We did it. It's beautiful. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I know that it was a lot. I know that there were a lot of surfaces that we were trying to paint and communicate, but 
you guys did awesome. Thank you for sticking with me. If you want to share what you made, please do. You can post it in our Facebook group called Let's Make Art Watercolor. We also have a um, Instagram account that you can tag us in it at Let's Go Make Art. You can also use the hashtag Let's Make Art. And that way you can also discover other people who are painting with us and all that fun stuff on Instagram. And if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. So, Michael, thank you for being here. You're very welcome. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.